All right. Well, we'll we'll figure this out. So um, today's talk, the clouds of glory, the real meaning behind the sukkah, far be it for me actually to overpromise that I have the real meaning. But what I have today is a meaning that I think is underappreciated in contemporary Jewish circles. So we're going to start at the beginning with the Torah and what the Torah says about the sukkah. Okay, can you can you see? I've got the commandment from Leviticus up here, and it says, it says, um, this is where where we have the commandment to dwell in Sukkot during the holiday of Sukkot. Okay, and it says, here's what it says about it: You shall live in Sukkot seven days. All citizens of Israel shall live in Sukkot, in order that future generations may know that I made the Israelite people live in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I, the Lord, your God. So tell me in the chat, what does it sound like from the biblical text the Sukkah is supposed to symbolize? And now I'm going to see if I can see the chat. Um, Mira, can you read the chat? Yes, I was actually going to say, um, but I would you read them out for me? I can't seem to get it up simultaneous with the slideshow. I'm sorry okay. about that, guys. That's fine. Um, someone posted simple shelter while wandering, freedom, mm -hmm. uh, coming out of Egypt with God, remembrance of our exodus, uh, dependence on God alone for life, memory of the desert. Okay, great. You guys are at already at a pretty abstract level here about the Sukkot. Nobody has said yet that the Sukkah symbolizes the huts that the Israelite lived, lived in as they came out of Egypt. No one wants to say that. I feel like that's the one I grew up with. Did other folks grow up with that too? Um, okay. Because you could see why we, from this text, we might get to that interpretation, that very common interpretation. Um, okay. So, all right. So here's, oh, here's my question. What does this kind of symbolize? Okay. And so let's, oh, okay. So, so, the common interpretation, which I was expecting many people to say, is that they do uh, symbolize these huts that the Israelites lived in when they came out of Egypt. And what I'm going to do now is suggest that that's not a bad reading of the text, but it has some problems with it. It has some problems. Here's the, here's the first problem. Here's what the uh, Torah says about the Israelites coming out of Egypt and what they were living in. Okay, I brought you six verses of many. And in all of these verses, it doesn't say that the Israelites lived in Sukkot. It says that they lived in Ohalot, in tents. Um, and this honestly makes sense for desert nomads, right? If, if you are, um, if you had to schlep a Sukkah out of your garage or basement last week to construct it, uh, you probably have the feeling that it would be a difficult thing to construct in the desert. Right, they're they're not they're cumbersome structures. Their tents are much more practical. Uh, and my favorite of these verses is actually Numbers twenty four five uh, on the top of the right column because this is the uh, prayer Matovu um, about the beauty of Israel's settlement, and it, it says Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov Mishkanotecha Yisrael. How beautiful are your tents, O Israel? Your, your O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. Because of the poetic parallelism, parallelism, we had two opportunities to use the word Sukkah to describe what the Israelites were living in, but the text doesn't take that opportunity. It describes the dwellings as tents, and the parallel to that is Mishkan, which is a uh, a word that means basically dwelling and is the word used for the tabernacle that was basically a big tent that the Israelites slept around the wilderness. Uh, but it doesn't say that they dwelt in Sukkot here. Um, the other challenge for this interpretation that the Sukkot emulate the booths that the Israelites lived in in the desert is a little more subtle. It's um, it's, it seems like a strange thing a little bit to commemorate insofar as a lot of our rituals uh, commemorate more fantastic things, right? On Passover, we celebrate the exodus from Egypt and we're talking about, um, we're talking about plagues and we're talking about splitting the Red Sea on Shavuot. We're celebrating the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai and we're reenacting revelation with thunder and lightning. And on Sukkot, we 
commemorate the, the little huts that they lived in. It doesn't, it seems like a strange thing to commemorate. Um, and the other problem with this interpretation, I'll flip back to the text for a minute, is that is the language here in Leviticus is a little is is a little suggestive insofar as it says, um, ki basukot hoshavti at b'nei Yisrael behot CEO Tom Eretz Mitzrayim, because I, the Lord, caused them to live in these sukkots, in, in these sukkot. And that suggests something a little more miraculous than a basic booth. Okay? So it turns out that there was a debate in early rabbinic literature about what the Sukkot were supposed to symbolize. Uh, and I'm going to bring that to you now. All right, this is from the Sifra. The Sifra is an early Tanaitic, meaning early rabbinic text that contains a collection of interpretations of the book of Leviticus. And this is the one attached to the verse in Leviticus that says you should dwell in Sukkot for seven days, okay? And here we have two rabbinic interpretations of what the Sukkot are. Rabbi Eliezer says they were Sukkot Mamash, Sukkot Mamash Hayu. They were literal booths. Okay, that's the interpretation that I often hear people say when they build Sukkot these days. So it is a classic rabbinic interpretation. Um, but Rabbi Akiva says something else. Rabbi Akiva says, Anane Kavod Hayu. They were clouds of glory that the Sukkot symbolized clouds of glory, which um, I think is a more unfamiliar uh, image for us today. We don't talk about it as much, I feel. So, and it seems strange. Why would, why would Akiva think that the Sukkot were clouds of glory? So what I'm going to do um, next is I'm going to show you some biblical texts that Akiva may have in the back of his mind that gives him this interpretation uh, and why the rabbis read this as Sukkot. And we will, um, and, and it will make more sense then in the context of these biblical texts. And then we will talk about what the rabbis do with the image. We'll look at a couple of midrashim to see what they do with this idea that God made the Israelites dwell in clouds of glory in the desert, what it meant to them. Um, but before I do that, I want to make one more bold claim, which is that in the ancient world, in the ancient rabbinic world, uh, Rabbi Akiva has the dominant interpretation. If you look across many rabbinic texts about Sukkot, this idea that the Sukkot symbolized clouds of glory is very common. And I'm going to prove that to you with a rapid shortcut. Um, I'm not going to show you all the texts. That would take a long time. Instead, we're going to jump to the Middle Ages, and we're just going to ask Rashi. So if you know Rashi, Rashi is a medieval commentator on uh, the best known medieval commentator on the Bible and the Talmud, and he is usually known as the shot commentator, the one who gives the literal meaning. That might not be so fair to Rashi, but he often gives the majority meaning. So you decide if he's being literal or majority, but either way, here is Rashi on this same verse in Leviticus, okay? I made them dwell in Sukkot. Rashi has a two-word comment on a nekavod. That means clouds of glory. Okay, so what is going on? Why do the rabbis think that the Sukkot, that the Israelites dwelt in in the wilderness, are clouds of glory? And what the heck are clouds of glory? Let's talk for a minute about clouds and God in the Hebrew Bible, because in our day and age, um, we are very common to we we are very accustomed to thinking of God as something as as something with no visual imagery. There's no visual imagery surrounding God in most of uh, in most common Jewish conceptions, and indeed in some strands of thought in the Bible. But in other strands of thought in the Hebrew Bible, there is a visual imagery that accompanies God. And one that is very common is that God is surrounded by clouds. So here is Psalm 1812. Okay. This says, speaking of God, he made darkness his screen, dark thunderheads, dense clouds of the sky were his pavilion, his sukkah all around him. Okay. So we have two things about this particular Psalm. One is that God surrounds the divine presence with clouds and that those clouds serve in some way as a sukkah. 
Okay, so you can see where some of these ideas are coming from, right? Akiva is not pulling this from nowhere. Akiva is pulling it very much from biblical ideas. Here's some more Psalms, just in case you thought that was a one-off about God being surrounded by clouds. Um, Psalm 97, 2, dense clouds are around him. Righteousness and justice are the base of his throne. Okay, and Psalm 104 which has some very interesting images of God wrapped in robes of light and things like that. Verse three says, he sets the rafters of his lofts in the waters, makes the clouds his chariot and moves on the wings of the wind. Okay, so here we have God riding on clouds. So there are many verses in the Psalms in which God is surrounded by clouds, but it is not only the Psalms. Okay, let's look further. All right, let's go to another place where clouds are found um, in, in the Hebrew Bible in conjunction with God. Okay, Revelation at Sinai. Um, in Exodus, the revelation, the moment of the Torah was revealed on the top of Sinai is described like this. On the third day, as morning dawned, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud descended on the mountain. And a very loud blast of horn, and all the people who were in the camp trembled. Okay, God's presence includes this dense cloud on the mountain. And in Deuteronomy, um, which recounts this event, um, we again hear about the dense clouds that were on the mountain. Okay, so again, God is often present in dense clouds. Um. This is not the only cloud that might be in Rabbi Akiva's mind when he says that the Sukkot that the Israelites dwelt in were clouds of glory. Another cloud that one thinks of in the desert with the Israelites is the famous pillar of cloud um, that followed, that preceded or followed the Israelites that led them around in the wilderness for 40 years. And there are many, many texts about this pillar of cloud and that it was a pillar of fire by night. Um, I've listed some of the others at the bottom, but I want to draw our attention here to three of them. Let's start with Exodus 13. The Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them along the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they may travel day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Okay, so in this case, two things to notice. Uh, One is that it says that God is actually in the cloud, right? Um, In other texts, it says that it's an angel of God in the cloud, the angel Malach, messenger, some, but but here it actually says God is in the cloud and that the cloud's function is as a guide, okay? But that's not the only thing the cloud does in the desert. Let's jump down to Exodus 14 here. And the pillar of cloud shifted from in front of them and took up a place behind them. And it came between the army of the Egyptians and the army of Israel. Thus, there was a cloud of darkness and it cast a spell on the night so that one could not come near the other all through the night. Okay. The the function of the cloud here is not just guide, but actual shield, right? It casts darkness. And there are some midrashim that say um, that when the Egyptians shot arrows at this cloud, they, they would bounce off of it. Um, it's, it's more than just a guide. Now the cloud is also protection. And, um, let's look at one more to get, uh, a deeper sense of this cloud that accompanied the Israelites in the desert. Uh, Exodus 40, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory or presence this is the, this is, I wasn't quite sure the best way to translate the word kavod of the Lord filled the tabernacle for over the tabernacle, a cloud of the Lord rested by day and fire would appear in it by night in view of all the houses of Israel throughout their journeys. Okay. So here the cloud, this is not exactly the same as the pillar of cloud. This is a, this is a cloud that occupies the Mishkan um, in the desert. And it's, and the text is explicit. Now we've seen the word glory now, kavod in this text, that God's presence is in that cloud. And notice that this too, like the pillar is cloud by day and fire by night, since a cloud, I presumably would be so visible at night. Um, Okay. 
So all of this might be in Rabbi Akiva's mind when he says that the Sukkot that God caused the Israelites to dwell in were clouds of glory, clouds of the divine presence. Um, Here, I brought you a picture. This is Benjamin West's picture of the pillar of cloud. It looks like he's combined the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire together in this image. Um, One other thing that confuses me about this image when I was looking at it this morning before the talk, and I'm curious if you in the comments can explain it to me. It looks like the Israelites are crossing the Reed Sea, but they already have uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So that, that doesn't quite work for me, <laughs> but maybe maybe this is a different scene. I'm not sure, but th- I thought this was a nice illustration of the, the cloud of glory in the desert. Um, okay. This is not the only place in the Hebrew Bible where we see God's presence dwelling in a cloud. Here's another one. This is the moment that the temple in Jerusalem was constructed by Solomon. The moment they finished the construction, here's what happened. When the priest came out of the sanctuary, for the cloud had filled the house of God and the priests were not able to remain and perform the service because of the cloud. For the presence, the kavod of the Lord filled the house of the Lord and Solomon declared, the Lord has chosen to abide in a thick cloud. I have now built for you a stately house, a place where you may dwell forever. Okay, so... Solomon builds the temple. And how do we know God has moved in? Because God's presence in the form of a cloud has entered the temple, a thick cloud. That's where God lives. And I have one more for you. There were so many that could be brought, but uh, one more. And I promise, I, I hopefully you've convinced that clouds and God go and divine presence go together closely in Hebrew, in biblical text. But this one I wanted to bring because it's got a bit of a messianic ring. We are now in the beginning of the book of Isaiah. Um, and it's a messianic vision that Isaiah is having of the end of times. When my Lord has washed away the filth of Zion and from Jerusalem's midst has rinsed out her infamy in a spirit of judgment and a spirit of purging, then the Lord will create over the whole shrine and meeting place of Mount Zion, the top of Mount Zion, a cloud by day and smoke with a glowing flaming fire by night. Indeed, over his whole shrine shall hang a canopy, a kupa. The cloud is a chuppah here, which shall serve as a pavilion, a sukkah, for shade from heat by day and a shelter for protection against drenching rain. Okay, so this is a messianic dimension to the divine cloud. It will occupy Mount Zion and um, it will be a sukkah that is protective for the righteous in the end of days and for God's shrine. It's cloud by day, it's fire by night. Um, and the, both the words sukkah and chupa are used, um, which we'll get at, an, at another dimension of these clouds of glory. This idea, because of course the chupa evokes images of a wedding canopy, and love is definitely a component of the experience of being in the divine cloud, in the anane kavod, in the divine clouds, in the clouds of the presence, or the clouds of glory. Okay. All right, so now now that we have all these texts swimming in our head, we can understand why when Rabbi Akiva reads Leviticus, I call where God says, I cause the Israelites to dwell in Sukkot, and the word there is Sukkot and not tents. And the idea is God is doing is making this dwelling happen. We can understand why it actually is a very, I think, persuasive reading of the text. I don't know if that's exactly what the biblical rab- writer originally had in mind, but but it fits with all these other um, biblical images actually rather nicely. And we can understand why it was a dominant image in rabbinic literature. Um, okay. It is frustrating me that I can't see the chat. I feel rather disconnected. Mira, would you just keep an eye on the chat and would you just interrupt me if there's something I should respond to? Do you mind doing that? Okay. Um, let's. Oh, sorry. Let's, I, I thought I was unmuted. I had something to. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, but thank you. The slideshow is an experiment for me. I'm seeing how this works um, from a mechanical perspective. And I unfortunately, I can't seem to figure out how to do the chat simultaneously with it. 
Somebody is going to email me afterward and tell me. Yeah, That's how I learn all my Zoom tricks. At the top. What? Do you have a toolbar at the top? I do. And I click on the chat and nothing happens. Hmm. That is I click on show chat previews and nothing happens. It's uh, okay. I don't want to waste everyone's time. We'll go ahead and move on. Okay. Um, so that but if you see something, please keep an eye on the chat for me, Mira. All right. So let's talk about the what the rabbis do with Akiva's idea that the um, Sukkot that God caused the Israelites to dwell in in the wilderness were Ananei Kavod, were clouds of glory. Okay. So um, they pick up on a lot of these themes that we see, we've seen in the biblical text, including the theme of protection. So for instance, here's one midrash about it. It's actually found in the Tosefta. So if you're familiar with the Mishnah, um, which is a second century, uh, early third century collection of rabbinic, mostly legal teachings, um, the Tosefta is a parallel collection that has the same structure, has much shared material, but is actually longer and has more material that's not in the Mishnah. Um, and this is one of the things that's in the Tosefta and not in the Mishnah. Okay. God gave the Israel gave to his children, the Tosefta says, seven clouds of glory in the desert, one on their right, one on their left, one before them, one behind them, one above their heads, and one is the Shekhinah, the divine presence that was in their midst. Yeah, I counted it didn't seem like seven either, but pretty close. And the pillars of cloud would precede them, killing snakes and scorpions, burning brush, thorns and bramble, reducing mounds and raising low places and making a straight path for them, a continuous ongoing highway. As it is said, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord traveled in front of them. Okay, so so this image in the Tosefta, the cloud, there, there's a specific, there's a set number of seven clouds that are in formation around Israel and amongst them. And their job is to protect them and to clear a path for them literally moving snakes and scorpions and brush and bramble and filling in um, ravines for them and, and filing down mountains for them so they can go straight on their way through the wilderness. There is someone in the chat who, or a couple people actually, who would like a link to the text um, so they can follow along. A link to the whole presentation? Yes. Would you like to send that link to me and I can make it into like a My Jewish Learning PDF something or um sure it's a google it's a google slideshow so i can just when we're done i can drop a link in the end is it will it be okay for people if i just share it at the end do they need it now i think they need it now there were a couple of people that said they were having trouble following along okay let me do that okay oh how's Okay. All right. And how how is the screen share working? Is everyone seeing okay? Um, yes. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Very good. Okay. So, all right. So, so we've looked at the Tosefta protection, um, seven clouds as protection and also sort of highway clearing for the Israelites. Let me share another one. Um, Okay, this is the Mechilta. Okay, the Mechilta is an, also an early Tanaitic rabbinic text. It is a collection of Midrashim on the book of Exodus. All right, and this um, is a lovely text that, that suggests the clouds are um, have a loving function. They're given out of love. So here, it starts with a verse from Exodus 14. And the angel of God going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and went behind them. Remember I said, sometimes the pillar of cloud seems to be occupied by God. Sometimes the text says an angel of God. All right, Rabbi Yehuda made of this a parable. So what is this similar? The cloud that moved in front of and behind Israel to protect them. It is similar to a king who was going on the way and his son went before him. Brigands came to kidnap him from in front. So the king took his son from in front and placed him behind for protection. A wolf came from behind. So he took him from behind and placed him in front. Then 
there were brigands in front and a wolf in back. So what did he do? He took his son and placed him in his arms. As it is taught, as it says, I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them on my arm. Okay, now the son is in the arms. The son began to suffer. So he took him on his shoulders. For it said, in the desert which you saw where the Lord your God carried you. Then the son began to suffer from the sun. He spread on him his cloak. For it is said, he has spread a cloud as a curtain. He became hungry, so the king fed him. He became thirsty. He gave him drink. So um, the 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 um, what what Rabbi Huda has done here with this parable is likened God to the king and Israel to the king's son and made it the clouds of glory are given out of love. This king will do anything to protect his beloved son. And just as God will do all of these things with the clouds to protect Israel. Hi, sorry to interrupt again. Folks in the chat are requesting that you hit the slideshow button. Uh Aha. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. No worries. They know I appreciate the feedback. Here, we're back to the slideshow. Oh, sorry. Uh huh. I thought I had found a sneaky way to see the chat, but I was wrong. Okay. Let's go um, to the next text. I've got um, two more for you. Uh, rabbinic text about the about the Sukkot as clouds of glory. Okay. This is from also from the Michilta. And this one is a verse from Exodus 12 that says, and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot. And in the in this text, it's clear that Ramses and Sukkot are geographic locations. One obviously named after the Pharaoh of Egypt and the other actually called Sukkot, which is a little confusing, but really a great opportunity for Midrash, that the name of the place is Sukkot. And indeed, Rabbi Akiva, who brought us the Anane Kavod tradition in the first place, jumps right in there. And he says, Sukkot refers only to the clouds of glory, as it is said. And now this is the text from Isaiah I showed you earlier. The Lord will create over the whole shrine and meeting place of Mount Zion, cloud by day and smoke with a glowing flaming fire, glow of flaming fire by night. For over all the glory shall hang a chuppah. This tells only tells me about the past. Whence do I know about the future? Scripture says, and he continues in Isaiah, which shall serve as a sukkah for shade. And it also says, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come with singing into Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. So what Rabbi Akiva has done very beautifully here is he has taken this little geographic note in Exodus about the stations in the journey that Israel is going on from Ramses to Sukkot, and he has spun out of that a beautiful messianic eschatological vision that got su- that Israel is going from Ramses, which evokes Egypt, to Sukkot, to protection in the divine cloud. And not only is that a current protection, but he uses Isaiah to show us that it's a messianic protection as well. And so when we sit in our sukkah, we not only feel the protection that Israel felt in the wilderness when God was close as a cloud and protecting them, but we are also anticipating a future messianic sukkah that we will sit in. All right. I've got one more for you because as you move through rabbinic literature and you move to later um, rabbinic texts, now we're in Amoraic um, texts a few centuries later, the messianic dimension is heightened. Um, and I just thought I would bring this one example because it's really evocative. Okay, this is from the Basikta de Rav Kahana. In the world to come, what will the Holy One do? He will expose the heavens, as it says, the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll, Isaiah 34, 4, and take, um, it says, I should probably say take, and take it, meaning the sun, out from under its sheath, and it will come forth in all its power and avenge the wicked. Sounds like global warming, right? As it says, behold, the day to come burning like an oven and the arrogant and all the doers of evil shall be straw and the day that is coming shall burn them to ashes and leave them neither stock nor boughs. So in the, in the end of times, 
God is going to bear the sun and let it burn everything evil. And at that time, God will make a sukkah for the righteous to protect them and protect them in it. As it says, he will shelter me in the sukkah on an evil day. That's the verse from one of the verse from Psalms that we saw. And it shall serve as a sukkah for shade from the heat of the day. And there is Isaiah again, the Isaiah verse again. Um, and I want to just pause here and say, since we're having this talk on the third day of Sukkot, um, and we are headed into the Shabbat of Sukkot, if you are going to synagogue this weekend and you're um, on Shabbat morning and you're going to hear the Torah and Haftarah portion, I'd love you to have this in your mind as you read the sometimes confusing Haftarah for Sukkot, which is the last chapter of Zechariah, Zechariah 14, which is this messianic end time battle kind of vision. Um, it's read on Sukkot in part because there is a sort of inexplicable mention of Sukkot in the text. But when we now think um, with this text of the Sukkah as representing the shelter that is that will be made for the righteous in end time, in the end times, when the sun blasts forth to burn out um, evil, it, it gives a whole nother dimension to that Haftarah. So I didn't bring it to share with you. I'm going to leave that for you to think about if you are going to synagogue this weekend to read that Haftarah. And if you're not, you can pull it up on Sparia or in your Bible at home, but it's, it's worth checking out. Um, okay. Uh, one more rabbinic text for you. I wanted to show you that the Sukkah um, that the the anane, the kavod, the presence of God, becomes in in a lot of these rabbinic texts really interchangeable with the shechina, the um, indwelling presence of God. And so I brought one example where it doesn't even say kavod anymore; it just says shechina. Um, this is from Song of Songs Raba, a collection of midrashim on the Song of Songs. You might recall that the Song of Songs is on the surface romantic love poetry. This verse that the rabbis are commenting on, 2.6, describes an embrace. His left hand is under my head. His right arm embraces me. Okay, what do the rabbis say about this verse? His left hand is under my head. That means the sukkah. And his right arm embraces me. That means the cloud of the shekhinah in the world to come. As it is written, no longer shall you need the sun for light by day, nor the shining moon for radiance. Who will provide light for you? For the Lord shall be a light to you forever. Okay, another messianic vision, another idea that the sukkah represents the dwelling presence of God and God's closeness. Um, okay, so I'm going to shift gears now that we have this interpretation of the sukkah in our head. We sort of understand why um, the word sukkah might be associated with clouds and with the divine presence. We've seen some of the images in the Bible that might make us think that. And we've seen some of the functions of the sukkah of protection, of love, especially of protection in the messianic end times when there's some sort of battle and evil is being destroyed. The sukkah will protect the righteous. Um, and so now I want to see if this makes any sense uh, with the laws of building the sukkah, if this can make some sense of the rabbinic laws about building the sukkah. So here I'm going to actually back out of my slideshow. I apologize. I know it's better this way, but I'm, I'm just going to back out for a minute or I'm going to try to. Why is that not working? Uh, whoop. Okay, there we go. Okay, because I want to see what you have to say in the chat. Aha. Um, uh, tell me what you know about the laws of building the sukkah. Okay, let's let's just get some of those out there. So, what do you what are the rules for a sukkah? Tell me what you know about what the requirements for a sukkah are. Okay, so okay, so Karen Alpert says we need schach and we need to be able to see through to the stars. It needs okay. Carol says we need three walls. Three walls, actually two and a half. Two and a half is correct. Um, the, the, I guess that's three, but one of them can be a partial. Um, the sukkah can't be used for another purpose. It has to be impermanent. Good. What else? Talk to me about the height. Talk to me about the location. Okay. 
Can you have a sukkah indoors? Pamela says height is nearly limitless. No, that's not true. There is a maximum height on the sukkah, actually. I think it's 20 cubits. Um, yep. Yep. Let me let me pull up some of the not manufactured for another purpose. Yep. Let me pull up. If you were with us, if you're one of the Dafyomi crowd and you were with us in Tractate Sukkot, you spent many weeks studying this stuff. Um, Samaritans have... I think uh, Michael means Samaritans have sukkahs indoors while Jews have theirs outdoors. Yeah. Okay. We're here doing Jewish stuff. It's true. Samaritans have a different interpretation of the sukkah completely. Uh, they're pre-rabbinic. Um, there's also a minimum height. Yep. You have to be able to fit in it. R roof has to be made of material that grows from the ground. Um, like the mist that rose at creation and watered the earth. The side of an elephant can be one of the walls. Yes, that's true. The walls can be made out of anything. The schach, very specific building materials. The walls, anything, even an elephant. Um, okay, a couple comments on that vein. Here are a few um, that I collected. Uh, by no means comprehensive. I'm going to go back into sharing my slideshow. Oops. Okay, because I know this is a better view for people. Okay, yes, the rabbinic texts tell us that the laws of the sukkah, the walls can be pretty much anything, um, even an elephant. But the schach has it very specifically has to be plant matter. It has to be plant matter that's not growing from the ground. It has to be cut, and um, it can't. You can't use like a tarp on top of your sukkah. And the schach are required to provide shade, and shade that's more shade than there is sun. You have to have, but it has to be a dappled shade. Some light has to come through. Solid roofing is not okay either. In other words, you could, you might think that wooden planks would work because that's a plant that has been uprooted, but solid roofing that makes it feel like an indoor space is not okay. It has to provide a dappled shade. Um, the sukkah can't be too tall. And if you, if you know this section of the Talmud, you know that the reason is the rabbis do not want you to sit in the shade of the walls, right? If you imagine a very, very tall sukkah, you're not really sitting in the shade of the schach anymore. You're sitting in the shade of the walls. Okay. Also, the sukkah has to be outdoors. Um, so the shade has to be protecting you from the sunshine. And that's also why it can't be under a tree. You can't be, even though the branches of the tree would seem like they do the same kind of thing, you have to specifically sit in the shade of the schach. And if it's under a tree, then you're sitting in the shade of the tree, not the shade of the schach. And if you are in your sukkah and you're eating or sleeping, there is supposed to be no barrier between your head and the schach. Okay, so if you put your bed in the sukkah, you can't sleep under the bed if it starts to rain or something like that. And you... Um, and if you're eating, you can't, again, you can't put a barrier between your head and the schach because the whole point, it seems to me, of many of these rules, and you can tell me if you agree, is that you need to sit in the shade of the schach outside. That seems to be the experience that the rabbis are trying to create. The schach provide a refreshing dappled shade from the sun, and you need to be dwelling in it. Do you see where I'm going with this? The, the, the idea of shade from plants also in the Bible is, an, is, is a common image of respite. Um, and so we can kind of understand why if the rabbis are trying to simulate the experience of dwelling in the ananei kavod in the clouds of glory that provide this kind of enveloping protection, the structure they come up with to simulate that experience is one where you are outside, exposed to the elements, and yet the schach are there creating a refreshing shade to keep you protected from the worst of those elements. You're out there, you know the elements are there, you can tell they're there, but the shade is also there to protect you. Um, Okay, so, so I'm going to just now bring a few biblical texts about shade and show how shade also functions in biblical texts as, um, as, as this idea of protection, even perhaps divine protection. If um, your mind is like mine, you might be um, 
going straight to the very end of the book of Jonah, where Jonah ha has left Nineveh, they've repented, and Jonah goes off into the desert by himself, into the hot, hot sun, and God grows a plant over him for protection, and, he, and he's refreshed. There are many such images in the Bible, um, but I thought I would bring, well, there we go, uh, one that I thought is a longer meditation on this image, and a really beautiful one, is Psalm 91. And I think that Psalm 91 is describing exactly what we are meant to feel when we sit in the sukkah under this interpretation. So I brought the whole thing. It's a little long. It's going to be two slides, but I, I thought it would be nice to read it to you. And you can see if you think it evokes those images and those feelings as well. It says, O oh, you who dwell in the shelter of the Most High and abide in the protection of Shaddai, another name for God, I say of the Lord, my refuge and stronghold, my God in whom I trust, that he will save you from the fowler's trap, from the destructive plague. He will cover you with his pinions and you will find refuge under his wings. His fidelity is an encircling shield. You need not fear terror by night or the arrows that fly, the arrow that flies by day, the plague that stalks in darkness or the scourge that ravages at noon. A thousand may fall at your left side, 10,000 at your right, but it will not reach you. You will see it with your eyes. You will witness the punishment of the wicked. Because you took the Lord, my refuge, the most high as your haven, no harm will befall you. No disease touch your tent, for he will order his angels to guard you wherever you go. They will carry you in their hands, lest you hurt your foot on a stone. You will tread on cubs and vipers. You will trample on lions and asps. Because he is devoted to me, I will deliver him. I will keep him safe for he knows my name. When he calls on me, I will answer him. I will be with him in distress. I will rescue him and make him honored. I will let him live to a ripe old age and show him my salvation. I, I, I think this Psalm encompasses many of the rabbinic ideas and images we have seen here about the Sukkot, that the, the Israelites dwelt in, in the wilderness, being the clouds of glory and having this protective surrounding, holding um, function, messianic function. Um, and I would humbly suggest that if this image of the Sukkah appeals to you, and if this interpretation of the Sukkah adds meaning to your holiday, and you would like this would be great sukkah art is to frame this um, particular psalm and put it on your wall. Because I think this is one of the things we are meant to feel when we enter the sukkah. Um, I got a private message about this. I saw at one point when I clicked out of the screen share. Um, and the other thing that may be going through your mind is the hashki venu, the evening prayer that is said, the second blessing um, of the Shema that's said in the evening. And... It may well have been composed in this same time period, um, and it also plays with some of these images. So it's something that we say before we go to bed at night, and it says, lay us down in peace, Lord our God, and raise us up again, our sovereign to life. Spread over us the sukkah of your peace. And of course, the word for peace, shalom, means wholeness, completeness as well. And later on in the, in the prayer, there's also this image that God should shelter us in the shade of your wings. Um, so if those ideas appeal to you, I offer them to you as one of many, not perhaps the real meaning of the Sukkah, but one meaning of the Sukkah for Sukkot. I think that very often we um, dilate and meditate on the, um, the fragility of the Sukkah and the temporariness of it and the experience of that. And I don't mean to take away from those images. Um, but there is another image on offer in rabbinic in in Jewish tradition. Um, you know, scholars will say that good good religious symbols are polysemous; they have many meanings, right? Um, and there's this other one on offer that the sukkah is actually quite the opposite; that it is about experiencing the divine presence and embrace and protection in an incredibly secure way when you sit there. So if that appeals to you, I'm hoping that's something that you can bring into your experience of Sukkot this year. Um, 
as uh, oh, I forgot I had this slide here, but here's one more shade slide that I'll share because this is a very familiar text that, and I just want to focus on the shade part here. This is from Micah. There's a very similar, nearly identical passage in Isaiah, also a messianic passage. In the days to come, the mount of the Lord's house shall stand firm above the mountains and it shall tower above the hills. The people shall gaze on it with joy and many nations shall go there and say, come, let us go up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, that he may walk, that we may walk in his paths. Now that all the nations of Israel have come to Mount Zion, where God is reigning, then instruction shall come forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Thus he will judge among the peoples and arbitrate for the multitude of nations, however distant. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not take up sword against nation. They shall never again know war. Now that everybody is obedient to the Lord, to, to Israel's God, the one God in Jerusalem, God can arbitrate among the nations and put an end to war. And the final image here, every man shall sit under his grapevine or fig tree with none to disturb him. The image of ultimate peace and comfort is sitting in the shade of plants. Um, okay. This wouldn't be my Jewish learning if we didn't offer you at the very end, something else to consider. Um, so if you enjoyed this image of the Sukkah and rabbinic texts, um, and if you studied Talmud with us, you, you might be thinking, hmm, I didn't see so much of that in the Talmud on Tractate Sukkot when we studied all of Tractate Sukkot. So for you folks, um, I, I invite you to go back to Sukkah, Tractate Sukkah, page five, and Rabbi Jacqueline Rubin Blair's piece there, um, where she talks about God's presence in the Sukkah. And it's, um, it's a very surprising, it was in the context of uh, where we were talking about how tall, how short, how wide, what are materials, all this legal stuff. It was this very interesting moment where the rabbis suddenly talk about where, how close God gets to the sukkah and does God dwell in the sukkah, above the sukkah, in the sukkah. Um, and I think that with these images in your mind, it might be fun to revisit that text. Um, so I'm offering here to you now the... Um, the URL for that piece that we that we published, um, I don't know, was it a year ago? When did we do Tractate Sukkah? I can't remember. Um, and for those of you on the call who are intrigued and interested in more Talmud study, um, I, I'm also including the sign-up link to our daily dose of Talmud. We publish an essay on every single page of Talmud at 5 a.m. Eastern every morning. Um, with lots of interesting images and ideas that come arise on every page of Talmud. So if you'd like to, if that sounds like fun to you and you'd like to follow along with us, you can sign up there.